The big 18-wheeler struggled to a stop as I pulled into the parking lot. I stopped the truck right in front of the mechanic's garage so old mechanic Ted could inspect it before he went back on the road. I was one of the few drivers for Masters Over the Road Trucking Service who did not own a truck. If I play my cards right, I will become one very soon. I have enough money to buy the Kenworth truck. I've had my eye on for a long time. My name is Charles Bennett. My friends call me Chase. I hate being called Chuck, Chaz, Charlie, CB, or any of the countless other names people try to put on me. I just don't react to them. My mom started calling me Chase when I was five years old because all I did was chase everything. It could be my dad, my brother, any girl I liked at school, or even a dog. I loved chasing them. It kind of stuck. And from then on, I became Chase. I opened the curtains in the truck's sleeping compartment to let my passenger and current partner know we were home. Evie, get your butt out of there or I'll leave you here, I shouted. The figure on the bed continued to snore lightly, without changing either volume or tone. I smiled, and then reached into the small bed cooler, and pulled out a bottle of cold ice water. I removed the lid, and then raised my hand over the slumbering figure with a mischievous glint in my eyes. As he began to tilt the bottle just a few centimeters away from seeing chilled water cascade out of it, she spoke. Chase Bennett. How many molecules are there in one drop of water? She asked. The voice was of medium timbre, too high for a man, but low for a woman. It was smoky, and at the same time somehow prickly. But this voice simply radiates warmth. It was one of those phone love voices that makes men adjust their shorts and tense their leg muscles. I don't know. Probably a heck of a lot. But I'm not a screwing chemist. So what do I know? I grumbled. I hated it when she asked me questions like that and ruined a good joke. Well, you should probably Google it to find out, she said in her slow, lazy southern tone, her smoky voice. Because whatever that number is, that's how many days it will be before you get any of me. If even one drop of this screwing water falls on me, she said. Even as she said this, I noticed that her body had not moved an inch. Her eyes were still closed, and she was still lying comfortably under the thick blankets we kept in the sleeping area. She was facing me, and a few strands of her black, asymmetrically cut raven hair lay across her face. Her skin was pale, and a few freckles dotted her nose and upper cheeks. She was beautiful in that insidious way that some women are. You look at her, and she's just standing there in jeans and brushing her hair out of her eyes and you don't think there's anything special about her. But when you see her next to a photo of some supermodel and compare her facial features and then the overall impression, you realize that she looks better. Well, maybe I'll just get it from someone else. I snapped before my brain was fully engaged. Even as the words left my lips, I knew I had screwed up. Those icy blue eyes opened, and she stared straight at me as if looking at me through her eyelids. The expression in those eyes hid our difference in age and height. I'm 42 years old, 5 foot 5 tall, and 91 kilograms, mostly muscle from constantly loading and unloading trucks. Evie is 24 years old, barely 5 foot 2 tall, and weighs 46 kilograms, fully clothed and soaking wet. But when she looked at me, a shiver ran down my spine. You better be talking about your hand because if it's one of those available girls from the parking lot or any other, I'm going to have to cowboy the crap out of her and make you watch. She said, seriously. Evie stretched her little arms up and arched her back like a cat does. Then she turned to me and looked at the clock on the bedroom wall. You're on time, she said. Get in here. There was no mistaking her invitation, and my semi-excitement turned into full arousal when she pulled back the blankets and revealed that although it was cool outside, she was wearing only very small lace underwear. Her gaze was filled with love, lust, and almost hunger as she gave me one of her white-toothed smiles. Heck no, not in your life. You'll have to wait until we get home, I said. The bus leaves in three minutes, so get your butt out of here or you'll have to walk. It's probably easier for me to walk home from here than it is for you, she said, obviously, noticing the state of my trousers. As usual, she was right. I was very excited, but I wasn't going to take any chances. All the drivers and mechanics were still telling me about the last time we were caught having love in one of the trucks in the yard. I jumped off the truck and began gathering our belongings from the storage containers on the outside of the cab. 
The yard was next to the parking lot for our personal cars, and from here I could see my baby before I could close the door of the container and collect all our things. Evie came down from the cabin. Chase, throw that crap on the ground, she said, laughing. As usual, I complied with her request and looked up at her. Catch me? she shouted, and stepped away from the truck, falling like a stone into my outstretched hands. Eve, what if I missed? I hissed at her. No problem, she said. Besides, I know that you will never let me fall to the ground. You love me too much for that. A grin appeared on her face that didn't want to disappear. Have I ever told you that I love you? I snapped. Maybe I just like having love with you. Don't even try. Idiot. The way you have love with me means you love me, butthole, she said, as if that explained everything when she straightened the blanket. I suddenly realized how she managed to get dressed so quickly. She didn't have time. All she did was slip her feet into her favorite moccasins and wrap the blanket around her. Heavy. Why aren't you dressed? said. What if someone sees you? I asked. Why should I get dressed? You'll still take everything off me as soon as the door closes. And if someone sees me, it'll probably make their day. So what's the problem? We walked across the yard, and I opened the trunk of my black Doro 6 Mustang GT. While we got into the car, she wrapped herself in a blanket so she could open the front door, but made sure there was a layer of blanket underneath. The leather of the seat would probably be too cold for her skin. When I got into the car and started it, the sound of the engine made Evie sigh again. I don't know how the heck she did it, but she put one leg up on the seat, leaned against the door, and turned slightly toward me without taking off her seatbelt. Luckily, the glass was tinted, otherwise anyone on my side would have seen what I saw. Eve's beautiful face was thrown back, and she was caressing herself. Just warming it up for you, Chase, she said, as she put the car in drive and pulled out of the parking lot. I narrowly avoided speeding tickets as I drove quickly toward our small rental home in Virginia Park. Our house, as usual, looked abandoned. We were on the road much longer than at home, almost before the car even stopped. Eve was out of the car and heading towards the front door, still wrapped in the blanket as I closed the door and turned to the trunk out of the corner of my eye. I noticed the blanket sliding off. I forgot about the things in the trunk and ran toward the house. There was no one around, but just in case. Eve was mischievous, to say the least. She would undress in the yard without any embarrassment, even if the neighbors were outside. I also knew that several of our neighbors had binoculars and telescopes for just this purpose. I walked over to her, just as the blanket fell, and threw it back over her shoulders. You're ruining the mood, she pouted. I quickly opened the door, let her into the house, and slammed the door behind me. Even as I turned to see where she went, I noticed a blanket on the floor at the entrance to our living room. A few more steps and lace underwear were on the floor like the fire, she said, smiling at me from the large faux bearskin rug in front of the sofa. I thought you already lit it. I grinned. I mean, in the fireplace, fool. I'm cold, she said. I quickly ran to the fireplace and grabbed a bag of kindling for lighting. I lit a few of them and watched the large logs burn for a few seconds after making sure the fire wouldn't go out. I closed the curtains. Eve was an exhibitionist, but I wasn't. Chase, take off your clothes, she hissed, and began to crawl towards me. I slowly unbuttoned my shirt, as if I couldn't remember how to undo the buttons. I've pulled off my shoes and threw them across the room, then began to work on my socks. She then unbuttoned my jeans and pulled them down. My favorite Mustang boxers were all I had left and she sat there giggling at them in a way that only someone who truly cares about me could do. She very carefully pulled down the revered underwear and then carelessly tossed it aside. Then she licked her lips and got to work. Chase Remember when we went to the baseball game a couple of weeks ago? She asked, gently caressing me. Yeah, I missed half the game trying to find you food and when I came back with the best Chicago hot dog ever made, you took a bite of it and said you've had better. I grinned. Chase. The baseball game was boring as heck, she said, smiling. I tried to give you a hint when I said I wanted a hot dog. This is what I wanted. She went back to work. I felt a buzzing in my spine and thought that now it would be good, but it turned out that it was my mobile phone in the pocket of my jeans under my back. Evie caressed me with one hand and took out her phone with the other. 
If it's one of your losers from the parking lot, I'll cut the conversation short, she snapped. No need to answer the phone, damn it. Let it go to voicemail. I croaked with a sadistic gleam in her eyes. Ava pressed the answer button and spoke into the phone. Hello, Pam? Yes, we are already home. Okay, I can wait, she said, winking at me. Then she moved the phone between her ear and shoulder and looked at me, who folded my hands in a pleading pose and whined like a puppy. She climbed on top of me and slowly started having love with me. I just lay there and watched her work. She smirked at me as she started talking on the phone again. Hello, Bill. How are you? She said as I shook my head. Yes, damn it. For that kind of money, we can come back. We were just having love. I know that all of you out there think that this is all we do. Of course. In reality, this is not the case. We were preparing to eat, but we will be able to eat on the road. We need to pack some things and take a shower, so we'll be there in about an hour and a half. Okay? Bye. And we continued to have love. When we finished, she rolled over and rose to her feet, trying her best not to laugh, and then rushed to the shower. Darn it, Evie, I shouted after her. What? she asked, looking out of the bathroom. Her expression was as innocent as a lamb's. Evie? I growled through clenched teeth. Are you finished yet? she asked in her smoky voice. It was a race, and you lost. I even gave you a head start. It probably takes longer as you get older, right? Then the bathroom door closed, and I heard her laugh even as the shower turned on. I'll think about Betty when I'm done with this. I growled, heading to the upstairs bathroom. The bathroom door behind me slammed downstairs with such force that I thought it would break off its hinges. And there Evie stood and looked at me. Evie's chest rose and fell with deep, heavy breathing as she looked at me. They looked like two halves of a melon on her chest. Her eyes were barely visible as she approached me, still wet and lightly lathered with shower gel. Evie pounced on me and started having love with me again. Then we lay silently, still connected with our eyes closed, holding each other after what seemed like an eternity. She whispered so quietly that I almost didn't hear her. I love you, Chase, I replied. I said, your little cartoon jerk could do it like this, she snapped. Evie didn't really like the Flintstones, but for some reason, she screwing hated Betty Rubble. Maybe because of her black hair and beautiful eyes. People always compare them. But for me, mentioning Betty always worked. We showered together and washed each other gently, then gathered fresh clothes and headed back to the freight yard. We went in her car because my Mustang was parked for the winter, as it was sure to snow in the next few days. Evie. Where is he sending us this time? I asked taking our large bags. Eva only packed large bags when we were away for more than a few days. I don't know exactly, but it's in Michigan, so it's going to be a long drive, which is why I packed for cold weather, she said, slipping her small hand into mine in quiet moments. Eva took every opportunity to touch me, even when she said Michigan. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up, and I tried my best not to give anything away. This job, depending on how much it paid, could have given us enough money to buy ourselves a truck. But I was already thinking about giving it up. Evie. Will we ever settle down? I asked. Seriously? Not until you're ready, she said, putting on her sunglasses and smiling. How will I know when I'm ready? I asked again. I'll tell you, she said, taking me by the hand and leading me to the door. Evie and I returned to the yard and went into the office. Bill hugged Evie and shook my hand. So these are good news and bad news situations, Bill began. The trip will be long, so you will be on the road during Thanksgiving, but it will pay almost double the going rate. So this will give you what you need to get that Kenworth you've been whining about for months. What's bad? Evie asked. Seriously? Well, you know, being on the road away from home during the holiday, that's why they pay so much. And also, why I didn't want to send one of the guys with his family, Bill said quietly. I'm his family, Evie snapped. And dear, I don't know how to cook at all, at least not on the stove. But that's not why he loves me, she continued. We feel at home on the road, just like anywhere else, so don't even worry about it. Where are we going? she asked, smiling. The trip is simply wonderful. You don't even have to help unload furniture and medical supplies to Michigan, to the Shady Acres nursing home. Bill laughed. Looks like that TV show. Well, 
The one where rich people move to the countryside. He laughed. That's Green Acres, girl. Bill laughed, handing Evie documents and information about his place of residence. They were both having so much fun that neither of them noticed that I was still standing at the table, frozen as a statue. My eyes were closed and I almost stopped breathing. What happened? Chase? Evie asked, looking back at me. It's easy to find out. Bill said he just realized that now that he has enough money to buy his own truck, he can't put off marrying you any longer. We're not going to get married, Evie snapped. Why? asked Bill. Well, mostly because Chase didn't ask me, she said quietly. And in general, we are not like that. The gloomy tone of her words killed the joyful mood in the room. In fact, the mood began to fade as soon as he mentioned the nursing home. What do you mean you're not like that? asked Bill. We're just friends and business partners, Evie said. I think everyone has the wrong idea about us. Our friendship simply brings certain benefits, but that's all there is. Bill burst out laughing and fell onto the couch in his office. What's so funny? Evie asked. Bill looked up at her, stopped laughing, and asked, Evie, have you ever traveled with other truck drivers? Of course not, Evie snapped, as if she had been insulted. I know that any or all of them, including the married ones, would jump at the chance, whether it included additional benefits or not. Heck, I'd start driving a truck again, and Elaine would kick my butt for the chance to ride with you. Does chance even pay you? asked Bill. No, not really, Evie answered. Then why are you traveling with him? Bill asked again before she could formulate a response. Bill turned to me. Chase, maybe let Evie take turns riding with you? He asked me. Does she help you a lot when unloading? Can it read the map well enough to navigate for you when you hit parts of the road where you can't use keys? Let me guess. When you pull into a truck stop for a little rest and see one of these, Betty's does. Just make room for it in the sleeping compartment? Or does it go and eat it while you indulge your base desires? Asked Bill, and all the reports about her damaging property, or getting into fights with waitresses who look at it. You cannot be true. Well, speak up he said. You travel together. You eat together. God knows. You sleep together in heck. Quite often as I heard you live together. Damn it, you finish each other's goddamn sentences, he said, placing his hands on his belt. I don't care what you call it, but for the most part, you two are already married. So deal with it, he hissed. Now get out of here and go to Detroit, he said, and ended the conversation. The truck we took for the trip was a large freight liner with air suspension. It's a really nice car, and the sleeping space is huge compared to what we're used to. We stopped and took plenty of snacks and drinks for the road, choosing places to eat and refresh ourselves from the restaurant lists on the GPS. When we left the yard, I think I've realized that I needed to think. So she just kissed me on the cheek and went to bed to take a nap. Evie would pose for a while and then come back to keep me company and watch with me. When it started to get dark, and we needed an extra pair of eyes. Are you a cat or something that requires you to sleep most of the day? I snapped when we got onto the highway. She knew this was my way of breaking the ice and starting the conversation again after my quiet time. We'd been together long enough for Evie to know when something was bothering me. She also knew that there were things I had to decide for myself. I don't want to upset you, Chase, but something happened to me while we were at home, she said. What? I asked, wondering what could happen. All these screwing three hours that we spent at home, we were together. Big, bad man, screwed. And now I'm so tired and tingling, she said, grinning. So I need to get some rest in case he tries to do it again. Do you think he can? I asked incredulously. I don't know, she said. But Chase, yes. Evie, I answered. I want him to do it because I liked it. I really liked it, she said kissing me again. Shady Acres Nursing Home. Malcolm Martin, 72, walked rookie Brad Stevens around the house. He would stop and show him where things were and how to find things that might interest him. Shady Acres was a fairly large house with many amenities, and Malcolm enjoyed being the unofficial tour guide. It allowed him to meet new people and help them settle in, as well as giving him something to do. Although Malcolm himself was a resident and not an employee, he had regular duties that, if not performed by him, would not have been performed at all. 
Many residents considered Malcolm the mayor of Shady Acres. Malcolm showed Brad, who was quite chipper for an 80-year-old man, the entire compound and the entire building from top to bottom. He saved this part of the excursion for last a long time ago. This would have been the best part of the excursion, but for the last three years, it has been the worst. If Malcolm had started here, Brad might not have stayed. Malcolm knocked on the large, imposing wooden door with a sign attached to it. The sign, said Director, and underneath it, there was space for a name. The place was empty, but it was obvious that some name had once been there. Malcolm didn't wait for the knock to be answered, but simply turned the knob and pushed the large door open until about three years ago. This door never closed. When Malcolm and Brad entered the large office, Brad saw a woman standing motionless near a huge desk and looking out the window. She turned when she noticed someone entering the room and met their gaze. The first thing both Malcolm and Brad noticed was that there was almost no expression on her face. There was only a blank look. She might have once been beautiful, but now she might as well be a robot. Malcolm was used to it by now, but it bothered Brad. It was as if the woman was a screwing zombie. He tried to put this thought out of his head and took a closer look at her features. She was actually quite cute. She had medium-length, white blonde hair that fell just below her shoulders and gray eyes. Her skin was very pale, as if she had never tanned. Her body had probably been beautiful once too, and still was, although maybe a little blurry in the middle. Her chest were large and inviting, but her legs and butt were a little heavy. A few months of training and she could be stunning, Brad noted. Perhaps the worst thing about her was her posture, even as she turned to face them. Brad noticed that her shoulders were hunched as if the weight of the world was on them. Her eyes seemed to be constantly looking down. Brad Stevens meet, and she's the director of Shady Acres, Malcolm said. Co-director Anne said in a voice like the sound of a nail on a chalkboard, extending her hand toward the newcomer. Nice to meet you, ma'am, Brad said. Brad shook Anne's hand carefully and noticed that even her hand seemed as cold as the rest of her. Cold and fragile. He thought to Brad surprised the conversation, and meeting ended there and simply turned to the windows, and Malcolm led them out of the office. As soon as the door closed, Brad began rubbing his hands and shaking Burr. He said, What a cold jerk. She has potential, though. I'd love to warm it up. A few years ago, this woman was hot as the sun. If you got too close to her, you got burned. She was the sweetest and most beautiful woman you had ever seen. Slender and gorgeous. You didn't need any Viagra around her. This place looked like a screwing construction site, Malcolm said. What does construction site mean? asked Brad, because she had so many exciting men around her. Malcolm said, stroking the front of his trousers. What happened? asked Brad. A tragedy in her personal life, which I won't go into, led to her fading, Malcolm said. This place is good, but not as wonderful as it was. Inside the office, the phone on Anne's desk began to ring. She looked at the display and saw that the ID field had only three digits. This meant an internal call. She reluctantly picked up the phone. Hello? she said languidly. And there's no way I can handle all these people for Thanksgiving if we don't buy more tables and chairs. Also, the medical laboratory needs materials, and the landscaping team cannot cope with the snow that should fall by Wednesday. We need to do something, said the voice from the phone. Don't worry, Claudia. Everything is already ordered. If you'd like, I'll email you the statement. The truck should be here by Wednesday morning. You will have enough time to set up the tables, and the crew will have enough time to clear the snow. If he does, and said, and hung up, she turned back to the windows, and in her crisp white blouse and gray skirt, she could easily be mistaken for a statue or an ice carving. I heard the sleeping woman yawn and smiled. I imagined Eve putting her precious iPad in one of the storage drawers in the sleeping compartment. She'll probably start taking off her clothes soon as if in response to my thought. A woman's hand reached out from the sleeping area and placed tiny black underwear on my shoulder. They'll give you something to think about while you're driving, I've said, and I don't want you playing your screwing hillbilly hippie music while I'm trying to sleep. Find me Taylor Swift. That's the problem with living with someone younger than most of my socks. 
I thought she has no taste in music. As soon as I heard E.V. start snoring, I started scrolling through the channels on the radio, looking for music to drive to. I heard an old familiar tune that I knew she wouldn't like, but I turned down the volume and frowned as the singer's deep, mournful voice came through, the speakers threatening to pull me into his melancholic mood, looking for the pieces of my broken dream. I wonder if the years have closed her mind. It's probably wanderlust, or an attempt to free myself from the good old faithful feeling that we once had. Carefree Highway. Let me slip away from you. Carefree Highway. You've seen better days. Morning blues, from head to toe. Carefree Highway. Let me slip away. Slip away from you. A layered barrage of guitars oozed from the stereo system, mimicking the tears rolling down my cheeks. I was completely lost in the emotion of the song. The sadness was good, just what I needed to release. The pent-up emotions that had burst free, at the thought of returning home. Unfortunately, it was short-lived as the mood was destroyed by a shrill, smoky voice from the sleeping area. Chase, darn it. Turn that crap off. Nobody died, so there's no need for a screwing funeral. If you like listening to this crap, at least play it backwards so you can get your dog and your truck and your house back. Evie said, find me some good darn music, something with a screwing rhythm. Despite my disappointment, I smiled because even never let me wallow in sadness. She always lifted my spirits no matter what. And although I never said it, I hoped that she knew that I loved her with all my heart and soul. I decided that instead of being afraid of what might never happen, I would focus on the positive on how to finish this darn transportation and buy yourself a truck. Evie and I would still work for Bill, but we wouldn't have to pay a huge rental fee to use one of Bill's trucks. Of course, if the truck breaks down, we will have to pay for it ourselves. But overall, we would earn much more, and maybe they could actually settle down. I couldn't believe I was even thinking about this after what happened last time. I knew that even considered me her savior, but in fact, it was she who saved me. And more than once, while she was snoring on the bed, I remembered our meeting. I was just about to pull out of the Wichita parking lot when a figure appeared in my path. The small figure ran as fast as he could, but the two larger ones were catching up with him. I jumped off the cab and did what I do best. I chased them when he caught up with them. The figure they were chasing stumbled, but they never got to her because I grabbed both of them by the scruff of the neck from behind and pulled them off their feet. Then he stood between them and the smaller figure and clenched his fists. I was bigger than both men. They stood up, sputtering and smoking. One of them raised his hands as if they were knives. I took a martial arts course while in the military, and I didn't like the way this guy stood. The little guy looked like he knew his stuff and was recovering from being knocked down. So I decided to get this over with quickly. I'm third down. The little man began as I charged at him, using my superior size and strength to knock the guy down as soon as he was on the ground. I knocked him out with one punch to the jaw. I always tried to get the smaller, faster guys on their backs where they couldn't use their fancy moves. One day, a guy who was about six feet tall hit my watch with a weird, spinning jump kick. This will never happen to me again, I thought, turning to face the other guy. But all I saw was his back butt and legs as the guy ran away, leaving his friend unconscious. You better run, butthole, shouted the small hooded figure who was now standing next to me. I turned to go back to my truck and heard this smoky voice behind me. Hey, guy. Thanks, she said. I just chuckled and continued walking, returning to the truck. I started it and watched as a small hooded figure stood on the edge of the highway and looked down as I started to drive away. The figure looked my way and gave me a thumbs up. Just as the snow started to fall. Darn, I said under my breath. I thought I was lucky because she seemed to be going in the opposite direction. Well, I could still just drive past her as I slowly picked up speed. The hood, pull it back, and I saw all this black hair spilling over my shoulders. She looked at me with her big blue eyes, and before I knew it, I stopped the truck. I knew you wouldn't pass by. She shouted through the open window. Where are you going? I growled. Probably to Wyoming and the wide open spaces, she answered cheerfully. And I'm going to Little Rock, I said. Sorry, I've always wanted to see Little Rock, she cooed. 
This is the town of my dreams, and it's right on the way to Wyoming. Get in the screwing truck, I snapped. She was so tiny that I had to lean over the seat and extend my arm as far as possible to help her up. As soon as I dragged her into the truck, I immediately realized that she was not simple. Where are you going anyway? I asked her. I told you I was going to Wyoming. But if you can only take me to Little Rock, then that's fine. Mr. Grumpy, she said. Wyoming is northwest of us, I snapped. She stuck out her lip and frowned slightly, but not much. Little Rock is located southeast of us in exactly the opposite direction. Every mile we travel will take you further away. So we're going the long way, she said, as if we were going to travel together for a while or something like that. How old are you? I asked before putting the truck in drive. Twenty-two, she snapped. Mr. Policeman, do you want to see my ID? You can bet your sweet butt that it is, I snapped back. She reached into her backpack and pulled out her driver's license. Her name was Evelyn Sanders, and she was indeed 22 years old. She leaned back in the seat next to me and set her backpack on the floor. Then, for some reason, as I started driving down the road, she just spoke to me. Do I really have a sign on my forehead that says, please talk to me? She moved from one place to another, and for almost a year, I could not understand what she was running away from but she worked at a truck stop as a waitress or something until she got enough money to move on or until she got a ride. She had hardly worked in the last week, and the money had run out. She met these two idiots, and they offered to feed her. I'm not a fool, she said in a smoky voice that sounded like cigarettes and alcohol. But in fact, it was what God gave her. I immediately asked them what I would need to do for food and travel. The karate guy, she said, laughing as she remembered how I knocked him onto his butt, said it was a way to balance the scales. They have money, and I don't. So to balance the scales, they are willing to share. I later found out that I also had to balance the scales. She continued, I have a woman's private part, and they don't. So I had to share. She turned and looked at me like she was taking inventory or something, and I couldn't look at her and drive at the same time. So I looked away. She giggled slightly, and then leaned back and closed her eyes. How do you know? she asked. How did I know what I answered? That I really have a sweet butt. She said, It's covered by my jacket, but it's really sweet. That was two years ago, and we haven't looked back since. We had problems at first. We both needed to overcome trust issues. Her problems stemmed from running away from an abusive family, and mine come from distrust of everyone, especially women. She seemed to trust me to a point from the beginning, but it took weeks to get past that initial level. Almost a month passed before I stopped asking her if she wanted to go her own way, starting in the next town over. This was the beginning of our first quarrel. It all started innocently enough. We were transporting several rolls of paper to Wyoming, and as we approached the state line, I remembered what she had told me originally and to start a conversation. I asked, is there a specific place you want me to drop you off in Wyoming? I can go out wherever you want to leave me, she said quietly. I looked at her, and for the first time since we had been together, I saw that she was crying. I felt like an butt and didn't talk about it anymore. The first time we stopped in Wyoming, I noticed that she had taken her backpack out of the car. She only did this when we were in places where there was a laundry service, so I knew something was up. I saw her talking to some creepy fat guy, and he looked at her and smiled. They turned towards his car, and I saw her flinch as he hugged her. I dropped the things I was taking out and walked up to them just before they got into his car. If you don't keep your screwing hands off her, I'll kill you. I growled at him through clenched teeth. Dude, she came to me. He whined. If you don't want your daughter to ride with me, just tell me and I'll leave. I'm not his daughter. Eva smiled. I'm his girlfriend, but he wants to leave me. He got into his car and drove out of the parking lot. Why did you drive my screwing car away, if you want me to leave so badly, Evie? He snapped, attacking me after the guy drove away. You said you wanted to go to Wyoming. Where? In screwing Wyoming. I snapped back. Well, you did your job getting us here, so I'm just leaving so you don't have to put up with me anymore since I'm such a burden to you, she said. Did I say you're a darn burden? I asked. Do you have any problems? Asked a state trooper who approached us while we were yelling at each other. No problem, officer, I said. 
You bet your butt there was a problem, she said. He drove my screwing car. Okay, guys, can I look at the documents? said the policeman. I took out my driver's license and handed it to him as he did the same. He thanked us and looked at the cards. You are 40 years old, sir, and your daughter is 21, so technically you are both adults. I know it's hard, sir, but sometimes we have to let our children make their own decisions. At 21, by law, if she wants to go out with someone, you can't stop her. But you, young lady, needs to listen to your father. He clearly cares about you and just doesn't want you to get hurt. The policeman said, Have a nice day and try not to swear. This is an area where there may be children for more than a minute. We just stood and looked at each other. Neither of us spoke. Why did you send him away? She asked. Because he was creepy and looked at you like he was hungry. And you were a darn steak, I snapped. And because you actually didn't want to go with him, I saw how you grimaced when he hugged you. Why do you care? You wanted to get rid of me from the very beginning, she snapped. If I want to end up where no one wants me, I just hitchhike home. So here in Wyoming, the scales are balanced. You have done your good deed. See you. Get your little butt back to the truck, I snapped. I'll tell you when you can leave. Really? She snapped. Yes, I said firmly in response. Well, Dad, she said laughing. You did something wrong. What exactly? I asked, smiling back at her. My butt isn't small. And why do you keep talking about it? I sat silently with my mouth open. I hadn't mentioned her butt for a month. After that, everything went relatively smoothly for a while, during which time we got used to each other and even started flirting a little. Eve was definitely flirting, but only with me. Whenever we stopped, she always made sure she was dressed from head to toe. I think her time on the road alone taught her to be as inconspicuous as possible and not try to attract attention to herself. I had a few friends in places I frequented, and we ended up having to make some adjustments. There was a waitress named Sarah in Tucson. The first time Evie and I were there, we had been traveling together for about four months. At that time, Evie and I had never touched each other. I don't mean love. I mean, we never came into physical contact in any way. That freak in Wyoming had more contact with her than I did. Sarah saw me get out of the truck and walk into her diner, and she rushed to hug me. Then she gave me a quick kiss and asked what I wanted to order. Just as Evie sat down at the table, they looked each other up and down and just got down to business. Chase, you didn't say you had a daughter. Sarah said, trying to make sense of the situation. Chase, I didn't know you liked old ladies. Evie snapped. I'm no more his screwing daughter than you are his grandmother. Are you trying to kiss all the men in this hole, or just mine? Evie, calm down. Sarah is my old friend, I said quickly, wondering how things got out of control so quickly. The food here is great. Let's just grab a bite and get back on the road. As far. As I remember, it was you who wanted to stop, I said cheerfully. Sarah tried to compose herself, and left after I told her what to bring. Evie. After Sarah gave our order to the chef, she sat down at the counter. Evie went into the ladies' room and asked me to play a song on the jukebox. Which song? I asked, perplexed, because we had never talked about music. Just play something I like. She said, you need to start learning what I like. I walked over to the jukebox wondering what the heck she meant. The jukebox was one of those modern ones that plays MP3s. I hadn't been there more than a minute when Sarah came up to me, put her hand on my shoulder, and ran it down my back. I still don't remember if it was more than just a friendly touch because it was over so quickly with all the flying glass and screaming. Evie came out of the ladies' room, saw Sarah come up to me and put her hand on me, and just grabbed the nearest thing she saw. It turned out to be a wrench that one of the clients put on the table. The wrench hit the jukebox inches from Sarah's head, followed by Evie. Sarah probably outnumbered Evie by about 20 kilos, but Evie was furious and heading our way. I intercepted her, grabbing her by the waist and leading her to the truck. After which, we returned to the restaurant to pick up our food and pay the owner for the glass in the front of his jukebox. We'll never go back to this hole again. Evie snapped as I pulled the truck onto the road. But the food is good, I said, trying to change the subject. The next time that jerk puts her hand on you, I'm going to throw more than just a wrench at her. Evie snapped, 
taking the bag of food and throwing it out the window. She then reached out and placed her hand over mine as I shifted gears. The touch of her hand was the first time I had touched another person in almost a year, and this cemented the bond between us. I don't know when it started, but at that moment, I realized that something was happening between me and Evie. I remembered her words to Sarah. It passed me by. At first, she said, Do you kiss all the men here, or just mine? When did I become hers? I'm sorry, Chase, she said, touching my arm again. It's not as bad as it will be, I answered. You threw our food out the window, so we'll have to live on potato chips for the next two hundred miles. Even after that incident, it was over a year before we actually had love. We slept together in a bunk bed, off and on for months before this happened. We were waiting out a snowstorm in Ohio for safety reasons. The roads were closed. We played a few video games and listened to some music before I told Evie I was going to take a quick nap so that when the roads opened, I could drive longer to try to get us somewhere closer to schedule. We lay next to each other in a sleeping place. I was wearing jeans and a flannel shirt. Evie was wearing sweatpants and a t-shirt. We always kept it warm and cozy inside the truck. I woke up in the middle of a dream because I dreamed that someone was licking my neck when I woke up. I discovered that this was not a dream. Evie took off her sweaters and sat next to me in just underwear and a t-shirt. She licked my neck very gently. And then seeing that I woke up, she began to caress my lips. Then, while giving me little kisses, she started trying to unbutton my pants. I started. She said, Don't ruin everything. She pulled my pants all the way down, taking my boxers with them. Then she climbed on top of me and started really kissing me. She pulled down those tiny underwear and sat on me. I am forty years old and have already been to this quarter several times, even though he was married. He had never felt anything like what he felt when he first had love with Eve. I don't know how long we've been doing this, but then a snowplow came by and cleared the road for miles without us noticing. I learned from Bill that the building where we were supposed to deliver the goods was closed due to the storm, so we would not have been able to deliver the goods anyway. We ended up going to the hotel to shower and found ourselves in the same bed for the first time ever. Coming out of the shower, wrapped in a towel, came and sat next to me. She wrapped her arms around me and kissed me. It was the best present for my birthday. She said, seriously. I didn't know what to answer, so I remained silent. Later that day, we went to the mall. We went from store to store, buying her everything she had her eye on. When they left one of the stores, Eva's mouth dropped open. She told the older woman behind the counter to stop checking out items. I know what you're trying to do, she said. I don't need any of this crap ever. I'm not trying to get rid of you. I laughed. Then it's even worse, she said. You already gave me a gift this morning, and now you're trying to sell me a bunch of crap and take it back. Evie, what the heck are you talking about? I asked the old lady behind the counter. Asked, what did he give you this morning? Evie simply leaned towards the woman and then patted me between my legs through my pants. He gave it to me this morning. She grinned and now he's trying to replace it with some and other crap. I wouldn't do that either, said the woman. You better make sure he's not trying to give it to some other girl. My thoughts raced through the months that turned into two years that Evie and I were together. The truck traveled several miles. We had just crossed Michigan when Evie climbed out of her sleeper and climbed back into her seat. Damn it, Chase, she snapped. Because of you, I missed two whole states. We'll pass them on the way back, I said quietly. Evie was on a mission to get us to have love in every state. Therefore, every time we passed through a state we had not yet been to. We had to duly christen it. I must have had a lot on my plate because I really enjoyed marking our territory in each new state as much as she did. If we stopped, we would probably be snowed in again, and your birthday would only be in a couple of months. I told her we'll probably be a little late anyway. She said, We have about 75 miles to go and it's already starting to snow. We'll be lucky if the speed is about 35 miles per hour. Evie was spot on, and we were passing through the large gate in front of Shady Acres. A little over two hours later, I drove the truck through the grounds to the main building and pulled into the back of the small loading dock. 
I pulled out and pulled the trailer in as easily as if I did it every day. Even Evie was impressed, because she didn't know that I had been doing this every day for a long time. Darn it, buddy. You're the best truck driver we've ever had here, said a voice. You reversed into that dock like a darn pro. Let me call the guys and we'll unload you, he said, going back into the building. Chase. Are we going to go out and stretch our legs? Eva asked. You can if you want, but I'll just sit here and play games on your iPad and maybe check my email, I said nervously. The snow was falling more and more heavily, and at least another 15 to 20 centimeters were expected to be on the way. I heard the moving crew unlock the trailer doors and begin to remove the cargo. Evie jumped off the truck and poked around. She returned a few minutes later and said, You can come out, honey. They're unloading the truck, but they're using hand jacks for the pallets. We'll be here for at least a couple of hours, maybe more. I reluctantly climbed down and stood by the truck, the hairs on the back of my neck standing on end as I waited for the inevitable. Hey! Trucker began a voice that I hadn't heard for almost three years. The roads are closing and our director told me to offer you a room for the night. You can rest, and don't let the crew rush to unload your car. It's okay. We're okay, I snapped. Chase. You're being rude, Avis said. Of course. We'll take a room then. Lowering her voice, she said, Chase, we didn't do this in a hotel room in Michigan. And this place is as big as a screwing hotel. Besides, I think while we're here, we should stretch something other than our legs. Immediately after the girl's words, Malcolm had a funny feeling. He walked over to look at the man, but his back was to Malcolm. You're just lovely, Malcolm said to Evie, taking her hand. Almost instantly, I covered the distance between us and slammed the old man into the wall. Keep your screwing hands off her mouth, I growled. Hearing the noise, a couple of guards came running. I looked at them warily but did not let go of Malcolm. Chase, buddy, you're hurting me. I'm not as young as I used to be, Malcolm shouted. Chase, honey, let him go. Evie said he just wanted to shake my hand. He is old and harmless. Let him go, mister, said the first guard, or will you hire a policeman? I grinned. You don't have a gun. Heck, you don't even have a baton. Are you sure? The 750 an hour you're making is worth it. The guard looked at Chase and thought. Go and get him, he said to his partner. Crap, I thought. Let go of Mel and headed towards the cab of my truck. Malcolm was rubbing his neck where Chase had grabbed him. Chase, where are you going? He asked. Malcolm honestly didn't understand what was going on here. The last time he saw Chase, they were best friends. Mel considered Chase his son. None of this made sense to him. But the miracle Malcolm prayed for happened. Evie, get in the truck. We'll unhook it and come back tomorrow for the trailer. I shouted, Chase, the roads are too bad. Malcolm said I was almost there a couple more meters, and I would have reached the truck. A few more seconds, and I would have been in the safety of the cabin and all this. The very thing I had been afraid of since Bill told me where my destination was could have been avoided. This also could have been avoided if I hadn't grabbed Malcolm. But I wasn't going to let that old jerk get away with it again. Evie also headed towards the truck. She didn't know what was going on, but if her man said to get in the truck, she got in it, and Bennett arrived at the loading dock moments after hearing some crazy truck driver slam Malcolm into the wall. Few things evoked such a reaction from her now. Some thought she had simply lost the will to live, but the news of the danger threatening a man who was not just one of her guests made in shudder. Malcolm was her friend, and had been for a long time, even before her husband left her. Back in the days when the two of them put every effort into making the twilight years fuller and happier for their charges, back when there was nothing they wouldn't do for the people they cared about. People whose own children sent them to such places because they didn't have the time or interest to take care of them themselves, went and saw the large man on the platform. She understood why security had called her. He was large, but there was something familiar about him. As soon as she stood on the platform, she recognized him, and her brain began to malfunction. This can't be true, she screamed as her mind checked, what her eyes were saying. Chase. She ran towards him as fast as she could. Nothing should stand between them. There was nothing standing except for one cantankerous brunette, a smoky voice. 
Wait, Grandma. How do you know, Chase? Evie said, holding out her hand, warning. Lee. Chase, who is this little girl? Asked. And the same little girl who will beat your fat old butt if you call me a little girl again. Evie snapped and tried to get around Evie, but the girl got in her way, no matter how she moved. Chase, why did you try to hurt Mal? He was like a father to you. Why did you leave us? Where the heck have you been? Asked, and I just turned and looked at her coldly. Yes, exactly, I snapped. What the heck kind of father he was, too. I just didn't want him to touch Evie with his dirty hands. Just because my last woman was a cheating jerk doesn't mean Evie has one, too. He won't be able to get this one, damn it. I'll cover his old butt with dirt first, and all the other old bastards, too. I won't leave this time, I yelled. More employees and many residents came to the noise and screams. Those who had been here for some time, both staff and guests, immediately recognized me and stared as if I had risen from the dead. Maybe we should move this to somewhere more private. Malcolm suggested, You two should probably talk. He won't go anywhere alone with that old brat. Evie hissed. Chase, the snow is still falling and the roads won't be cleared until tomorrow morning, and said her thoughts were still preoccupied with her husband's sudden appearance. She didn't care why he left her, or where he was, or how many women he slept with. All that mattered was that he came home to her, and she wouldn't let him leave her again without a fierce fight. Her entire adult life had been spent in love with this man, and this freckled jet, black-haired tramp would never take him away from her. Why don't we prepare rooms for you and your friend? A room and a girl. Evie snapped, interrupting her. What are you talking about now? Asked. And you said, Rooms Grandma Moses. Evie snapped. We only need one room, and I'm not his screwing friend. Well, maybe I am his screwing friend because we have love a lot, but I'm his girlfriend. Who the heck are you? I'm his wife. And snapped. Everyone was quiet for a while. Evie was stunned into silence. I was as angry as ever, and old wounds were reopened. Malcolm was shocked by my sudden return home and, and was trying to figure out what she could do to keep me here and why I had left in the first place. An hour later, the four of us were in the room that Anne had given us. Malcolm and I sat down across the table from each other and sat down next to me. She seemed to be trying to get as close to me as possible. She hadn't touched me yet, but it was inevitable that she would try, and probably soon, to prevent the carnage that would likely erupt when this happened. I stood up and walked across the room to where Evie was nervously pacing the floor. I put my hands on her shoulders and pushed her onto the bed. Evie, you shouldn't be nervous, I said. I was afraid to come here. But now that we are here, we can get this over with, so we can move on. But I don't want to live on without you, she whined. Chase, I... Don't worry, I said, interrupting her. Everything will be fine. You were right. We should have stayed in the damn truck. The tractor alone weighs more than eight tons. The snow could only slow us down. We could pull off the road and wait it out like we always, she said. Next time? I said gently, brushing the hair out of her eyes. Will there be a next time? She asked, catching my hand and holding it before I could answer. Someone knocked on the door and then entered. It was an elderly woman with a tablet for notes. Her brown hair was streaked gray, and her smile radiated health and happiness. She came up to us, took me and Evie by the hand, and led us to the table where an and Malcolm were sitting. I'm Bertha McKinney, she said, a psychiatrist, not that any of you are crazy, but, and asked me to lead this meeting to try to maintain a positive attitude. Does anyone here object to my presence? she asked. Why do we even need this darn meeting? Evie asked. Why don't you guys just unload our truck and we won't bother you? Better yet, we'll come back and wait in our truck. And you guys just knock on the side when you're done and we'll get the fudge out of this asylum. I can understand your reluctance to participate, miss, Bertha said. But there are some of us here who have a lot of very important questions that we would like answers to. And since the snow is accumulating so quickly, none of us are going anywhere anyway. Let's start with a simple question, Mr. Bennett. In addition to my resident counseling duties, I have been working with your wife for the past several years, trying to help her cope with her problems. She was clinically depressed for a long time. Of course, this was caused by your unexpected departure. Would you like to talk about it or say something? No, I said, and laughed. It's over. It was crap anyway. 
What the heck are you talking about? And screamed. You just left me here three years ago without saying anything. We were happy. I loved you then. More than anything in the world. And I know that you loved me. We had a wonderful life. Don't you dare call it crap. You probably really think that since I was stupid then. I'm stupid now. I said perhaps this is not the best question to begin with. Bertha said, let's try something simpler. As far as I understand, you and Mal were very close. So why did you attack him today? And without any provocation? Slam a 70-year-old man into a wall? She asked. It was his fault, I snapped. He himself is to blame. Like this? Asked Bertha. What did he do? He misinterpreted me, I said. It doesn't matter. I forgive him, Mal said, extending his hand to me. I just stared at her like he was offering me a dead rat. I don't need or accept your screwing forgiveness, I snapped. It was you who screwed up, not me. You should have been smart enough to stay away from Evie. Okay, we haven't gotten anywhere. Why don't we try a different direction? And why don't you start and tell me what you remember about the time you spent with your husband? Does anyone object to this? Asked Bertha. I don't care who says it. Let's just get this crap over with. But I object to you calling him. Her husband said Evie. Chase and I were happy and began looking at Evie. After being married for about eight years. I had an opportunity. I graduated in healthcare management and was tired of working in hospitals. I was offered the position of manager of Shady Acres and I really wanted it. This would give me the opportunity to have a more personal impact on the lives of the people I cared for. Of course, I couldn't do this without Chase, because we would have to move to this state to do it. I knew that his business management degree Chase could find a job anywhere, but I was still worried that he wouldn't be willing to just move to another state. To my surprise, he fully supported me. He even came to work here with me, knowing that we did not have enough employees. This place has become our life, and the guests have become our extended family. We put almost everything we could into this place, and were happy. I handled most of the patient while Chase handled the day-to-day -day activities. We were a great team. It seemed that every day we loved each other more and more. There was nothing I wouldn't do for Chase, and I've already seen the lengths he's willing to go to to make me happy and said, Be strong. I've said loud enough for everyone to hear. Don't puke no matter much of this crap, she spills. Just keep it in. She looked up and smiled, noticing that everyone was looking at her. Sorry. I didn't think you could hear me, she said, smiling and cleared her throat and spoke again. One day, Chase just disappeared without warning. We didn't have a fight or anything. He just kissed me goodbye. Said he was going out to get the things I told him we needed and hasn't come back since. At first we all thought there might have been an accident, but the truck was parked at the gate and his Mustang was missing. All his clothes were there. Only Chase and his car were missing, she said. Tears were streaming down her face, and it was obvious that she could not continue, and just changed overnight. After Chase disappeared, Malcolm said, continuing the story, it didn't just affect her, it affected all of us. We were like one big happy family, and then one of the most important parts of that family disappeared without warning. We all rallied around Dan to make her life easier and support her, but it was like she just died, and there was nothing left of her but a shell. She never came out to talk to us anymore. Where? Before she was always there. She is now just an administrator, and we miss her for who she was, and had the gift of seeing people's pain, and doing something to make them feel better. She was an angel to all of us. She did for us what no doctor or anyone else could do. She brightened the lives of many old people in a way that even their families could not do. She was a gift from heaven, and Chase was like the son we never had. He was always there to help too. They were the perfect couple until he disappeared and broke man's heart. Malcolm said, We searched for him for several months, but could not find a single clue. All the detectives thought we should look in management or business because that's what he went to college for. No one could have predicted that he would become a truck driver. Bertha saw me lean back in my seat, shaking my head and giggling. Would you like to add anything? She asked me. They gave you the textbook version but they left out a few important details. I began, like those two idiots said, I quit my job and moved to this state with Annie because she was right when she said I loved her and would do anything for her, 
and I really thought that we loved each other, and our life together was wonderful, or so I thought. But it was all nonsense. She never loved me. And if she even thinks that she did, then she is darn crazy. You don't cheat on those you love. I loved you and still love you. I would give anything to have you back and said loudly. I looked at her across the table, and in the coldest voice I could muster, I said, I listened to your BS version of everything, so give me a chance to tell you how it really happened. Please continue, Bertha said. As I said, we worked here to make everyone's life better. We did everything possible for the guests and Wisconsin throwing parties and trips, doing everything she could to make this place better. But she went too far. About a year after we moved, I began to notice that Anne was constantly sending me things. It didn't bother me because I wanted to help in any way I could. But sometimes I wondered why she never sent anyone else. I looked around the table and noticed that everyone in the room was looking at me, and it was so quiet that I could hear the snow falling outside the window. It so happened that one day I went on one of these little trips, and before I had gone far, I noticed that I had forgotten the list that she had compiled. I turned the truck around and drove back. I didn't want everyone to joke that I was getting old, and the first thing I was losing was my memory. You know how the stories start about how your memory is bad at first, and you need a list to remember what you need. Then, someone has to remind you that you had a list. So I decided to just go back to the office, take the list, and go on my way, not paying attention to anyone. First, I needed to make sure there was no one in the office, so I tiptoed through the house. I thought I was a screwing ninja. That's how I moved. I slid around the corners and made sure no one noticed me. Then, when I finally found myself near the office, I noticed a line of five or six residents outside the office. I didn't know what the heck was going on, so I watched the door opened and Claude Jenkins came out. He was a bitter old jerk. Even at 85, he never had anything good to say about anyone but Anne. And I began to think I knew why. When Claude left the office, the next old man immediately came inside. I went back outside and crept up to the edge of the building. I looked into the office, and my heart sank and almost stopped. There was my wife, my best friend, my soulmate, the woman I gave up my screwing job and career for, and moved across the country so she could follow her dreams. She was bent over her desk with her skirt hiked up at her waist like a two-dollars chick, and my best friend Malcolm owned it. Bertha's surprised gasp and the shocked looks on the faces of everyone present made me pause. But I can explain everything said Anne, starting to cry. Sorry, I said, but it's still my turn. I'm almost done. And then Eva and I will leave here. I've stood up and took my hand because she saw that I was having a hard time, but I needed to let it all out. After all this time of holding it inside, I couldn't think of a single reason why Anna would betray me in this way. As I already said, we never quarreled. I did everything she asked because I loved her very much. Even things I didn't want to do, because it was better to be a little unhappy than to risk losing her. Our love life was great. We rarely missed a night. At least that's what I thought. However, looking out the window, I noticed one thing and leaned over the table, allowing them to have her from behind. She had not allowed me to do this with her for a long time, and I missed it. You can't tell it now because she's gained weight. But Anne used to have the most beautiful round butt in town, and I loved watching me control her between those perfect balls, but she just didn't feel comfortable in that position. Now I know why she saved this position for her geriatric entertainment. It was more like a train. Remember the dance TV show from the 90s Soul Train? So Anne was the conductor of the old men's train. I think I had a lot of ways to deal with it. I could go there and beat the crap out of a lot of old people. But what would that do? I was younger and stronger, all of them combined. I could go there and slap in, but I've never hit a woman in my life. I stood and just watched her, not seeing the expression on her face. But obviously this had been going on for a long time, and that's why she always sent me to the city for everything. We all make choices every day in our lives, and I think, and chose those old people over me and our marriage. So since this was what she wanted, and I had experience giving her what she wanted, I simply left the truck keys in the dining room and headed to the garage. My Mustang is not the standard 4.6-liter V8. I swapped the engine for one of the Ford racing engines. 
a larger displacement V8 with a choke. It produces approximately 462 horsepower through a Magnum Flow exhaust system. It's pretty fast, but also pretty darn loud. I almost never drove it at the time, because when I started it, it could be heard throughout the house and, and would run out and tell me to turn it off. I just drove away and never looked back. Looked but, and began. It's still my turn, I snapped. I was pretty angry for about a year. Didn't talk to anyone. I didn't need friends or anything else. I thought about what I did or where I went wrong, but I just couldn't figure it out. God, how I missed her. But after a while, even this faded away. I began to realize that, as I said, we all make choices and, and chose to ignore my feelings and possible consequences in favor of what she did. So I either cut myself off from life or just move on. I started looking at women again. The first one was probably Ruby in Memphis because she looked like an younger and had bigger chest. Having love with her in every way seemed to give me the closure. I needed to just leave the marriage behind me. I paused because two women were at me with angry eyes at the same time. Our marriage is not over, Chasen snapped. We can and will work things out. You don't understand. She started to say something else but was interrupted. Shut up, Grandma. He's done with you, Evie snapped, looking at me with fire in her eyes. I knew that jerk was after you. Next time we go to Memphis, I'm going to fudge that bottle blonde. Those chests aren't even real, Chase. If my chests are not big enough for you, then you will be better off with Grandma. Her chests are probably waist level when she takes off her bra, but at least mine are real. Can I please finish? I asked, since neither Evie nor Anne objected. I looked at Bertha, and then at Malcolm, who had his head down and couldn't look at me. I didn't file for divorce because I decided that if Anna wanted, she could pay for it herself. I also didn't think I'd ever get married again, so I didn't need it. I simply refused any job that required me to go to Michigan for a while. Then, when all the car parts started coming here and here, I decided it was stupid and just didn't take any jobs in Detroit. I was just starting to feel human again. I had a new life, a few friends across the country. Nothing serious, but life was good again. There was still a little loneliness in my heart, but I decided that it was just lingering traces of feelings that I had left for Anne. I heard her sob softly as she did so. Then I met Evie. She was brash, rude, angry, and insanely jealous. The complete opposite of Anne. She's too young for me, and we have absolutely nothing in common. We constantly argue about everything and everyone. I don't know how or why we haven't killed each other yet. Wait, I know. It's because I love her. Like there's no tomorrow. She took away all the pain I received from Anne and made me whole again. All this time I avoided coming here because deep down I was afraid to return. Was afraid that I would feel like I had given you everything I had. And it still wasn't enough. I looked straight at and as I said this. But suddenly it doesn't matter what you think, Anne. Because Eve is my life now. So if we run into you, then so be it. I was no longer afraid. Then we got... I saw Malcolm, and when he touched Evie, I just lost it. I won't apologize to you, Mal. I'm sure you understand why. But it's... And that's my sad little story, I said, and stood up. Come on, TV. The unloading should have been finished by now. Let's hit the road. Evie stood up to follow me, and we both stopped when, and jumped up in front of the door and said, Wait. Evie and I looked at her silently. Bertha was still in shock and couldn't say anything, and Malcolm was still sitting at the table muttering to himself. You do not understand, said Anne. Don't you want me to explain it to you? No, I said, and headed towards the door again. Let her speak, Evie said. We have already heard so much. We can hear the rest so that it all ends. Evie and I sat back down at the table before and could begin. Malcolm burst into tears. Sorry, Chase. I didn't mean to hurt you at all. You weren't supposed to find out. It was stupid, he said. Great, I snapped. I wasted my life and lost my marriage because of stupidity. Chase, I love you so much that I still sit by the window day after day, waiting for you to come back. If you hadn't shown up today, right now, I'd probably be sitting there waiting for you. I knew that a love as strong as ours could not fade, and that you would return, said. And as you already said, 
We loved each other. You talked about how much you loved me. I loved you just as much. And I still do. You were the only man in the world for me. And you will always be. When she said this, Evie snorted and laughed. Chase. Only two things were important to me back then. First of all, you. And second of all, this place and my people. If you remember, some of those older guys were very depressed, almost to the point that they simply lost the will to live. One of the worst was Claude Jenkins. He didn't care anymore. I started talking to him about it and found out that even at his age, he has a very strong love drive. I thought that an 80-year-old man didn't know what to do with this. Anyway, one thing led to another, and I started wearing slightly more revealing blouses around Claude, and it got results leading to more and more teasing. And finally, some touching. I never told you about this because I didn't see anything wrong with him, but I knew you'd be furious. It took time, almost six months, but he began to fade away again. He became so depressed that he did not leave his room. I had to get Malcolm to him, to my office. And that's when you went on your first shopping trip? I felt darn guilty, but I was determined to save this old man's life, and I succeeded. Chase. He could barely continue, but over the next few weeks, he became human again, better than ever. I was amazed that something so simple worked when all the drugs and psychologists had failed. It didn't cost anything, didn't take anything away from us and worked so well. I didn't think for a second about what it might do to you. To us or to our marriage, but if I had, it would never have started. I was just so happy that it worked and I thought that if it works for him, well, you know the rest. I didn't take anything from you. I didn't like them, just giving them a taste of what you got every night. And she only did this while leaning over the table because she didn't want to see them or think about it. But with you, I stopped doing it in this position for two reasons. Firstly, I didn't want to do the same thing as with them. And secondly, I liked to look into your eyes when we made love and see all your love for me, she said. When I was with them, I didn't think about anything except what was happening. It was easy because, let's face it, they were old people. It's not like they were going to rock my world or anything, but they loved it. Every night with you, I just wanted to completely focus on all the love we had for each other. I never thought you'd find out. And it was only supposed to be temporary. Everything just got out of control. I'm so sorry, Chase. Until now, I didn't know you saw it. You must have been devastated. All this time, I thought you ran away because you were tired of me, especially when he showed up with her. Can you ever forgive me? Yes, I said. You are forgiven. Every stood up, clearly angry, but sat back down when I looked at her. And what about me? Malcolm asked, looking at the floor. He clearly felt guilty now. We were friends and good ones, I think, I said, turning to him. Mel, do you believe in God? I asked. Yes, he answered. I go to church and pray often. I'm getting old and I don't know when I'm going to die, so I need to be prepared. Well, Mel, I said, smiling at him. I hope it's soon. And I hope you know you'll be rotting in heck for a long time. Isn't coveting your neighbor's wife one of the ten screwing commandments? No. Damn it. I don't forgive you. And I won't forgive you. But this is water under the bridge. I once thought I would never get over Anne, but I did. And coming here was an important step. Now I can get a divorce and stop living in this screwing past. I heard that there is a special part of heck reserved adulterers, I added. You have a wonderful life, and I'm serious. We could have had her, but you put other men in front of me. I would still like for us to be friends someday, but it will take time. Don't be surprised. As soon as I return home, I will immediately file for divorce. I hope you can move on with your life too. I'm sure you'll meet someone else. And this time, I hope you won't lie to him or hide anything from him. I touched her shoulder gently as I opened the door and walked down the hallway with Evie following behind me. Even through the closed door and in the middle of the corridor, we could hear Anne crying and Bertha and Mel trying to comfort her. Cheating and hiding the truth always has a way of coming back to bite you in the butt. And I guess, and finally had to face that. But perhaps her motives for cheating were pure to some extent. Maybe she started out with the best intentions and really just wanted to help. 
but they say the road to heck is paved with good intentions. Maybe I'm the bad one, because I don't care why she did what she did, and we both ended up losing a little. I think because I am the only one who survived it, and was the first to move on. It might seem like I won, but in this situation, I'm not sure there is a winner. I was happy now, but I sincerely wished only the best for Anne. It made me think a lot about life and love as I walked to my truck first. I realized that there are endless possibilities for all of us. It is quite possible that I would never have found out about Anne's betrayal, and we could have lived happily for the rest of our lives. There is also the possibility that I could find out about this, meet her, and forgive her. But in reality, I am not that kind of person. It's not about how strong my love for her is. It's about the fact that for some people, myself included, love requires trust and loyalty. Andrew both. And for whatever reason, she ended our marriage. If I could get her back, I would never trust her again. And I also know that neither she nor I would respect me anymore. I would no longer be the man she married. And I wouldn't like looking in the mirror either. And speaking of mirrors, and should have stayed in my rearview mirror, the seat next to me belongs to Eve. A few minutes later, we were back in our truck, warming up the engine. Eve lay on the bed and looked down at me bare as usual. Even the snow stopped falling. Hey, before you start snoring, I need to tell you something. I said yes, I already know. She snorted. Grandma has bigger chest than me. It's true, I said. But it's not that easy. I love you more than anyone and anything in the world. When I get divorced. Will you marry me? I already knew that butthole. She snapped. How can you ask me to marry you when you don't even have a screwing ring? Come back when you're ready. I need to sleep heavy. Look at me, I said. I couldn't believe it. But her cheeks were wet. Heavy. Why are you crying? I'm not crying, damn it. There's something in my eye. Let's get out of here so you can buy me an engagement ring, you darn tight. Wed as soon as I put the truck into gear. I heard on the radio that the snow warning had been cancelled and the highways were open. I flipped through the channels looking for some good driving music and found a familiar song blasting through the speakers, leafing through the pages of those times that I love most. I wonder if she does the same now, what I call life. It's just satisfaction, I know that. No is to blame. Carefree Highway. I got to see you, my old love. Carefree Highway. You've seen better days. Morning after blues. From head to toe. Carefree Highway. Let me slip away. Slip away from you. This time the song didn't make me sad. I had dealt with the past, and it no longer me feel terrible. I looked out the windshield at the road ahead, and began to lose myself in the music. <laughs> 